I think uh, I would start with probably what you have heard is the new normal for IMF, uh, both in terms of, uh, I think the fund has learned, particularly from the more recent set of crises that uh, actually have gone beyond simply the developing world, but also some of the developed world, uh, that uh, there are certain important issues that may need to be looked at uh, beyond the usual analysis and the mandate that the fund actually has. Uh, and I'll refer to some of the things in here. Uh, and the main reason I started with that uh, is really to applaud that uh, ultimately the, the fund actually is aligning to a whole range of concerns that have been uh, quite alive, uh, not only in the academic sphere, uh, but also on the policy side. Um, if I was to roll back my 10 years as governor uh, and I was to move forward with this kind of view that the fund now has, I think my life would have been much easier than it has been uh, in the cause of the actual uh, part. So it is uh, a positive applause, I think, uh, ultimately, that this important influential institution uh, has come to terms with very uh, important uh, developments. Now, my comments will be made from two perspectives. One is alignment of the fund research, which we just heard, with the major emerging development concern uh, of inclusion. Uh, and we know this comes on two dimensions as an end or objective uh, on its own, uh, behind the term leaving no one behind, and also as a means to development. Uh, and I think the bulk of uh, Jonathan's uh, presentation has focused particularly on uh, looking at inequality and redistribution uh, in the context of uh, 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 how uh, it aligns with uh, developments in growth um, and uh, uh, also welfare more generally. Um, a second perspective is alignment to the core mandate of the fund that of uh, providing policy advice for macro stability and sustained growth. How does this perspective uh, uh, fit uh, with this? And uh, I think uh, the, the authors uh, know that this is our second engagement we have had. So uh, I wouldn't want to belabor on the points that I made a lot uh, earlier uh, they made this uh, 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 presentation in Oxford. Uh, I was also a discussant. And uh, uh, I think there was a very high degree of appreciation uh, for how the fund uh, uh, is actually coming to terms with fairly difficult uh, questions uh, in the context of the, the mandate. Uh, I did raise also a question uh, in that uh, connection of how ideas move from research, which is sort of the thought frontier, uh, to operations. Uh, at least in today's presentation, we did hear a bit about how these ideas are being brought uh, into a country operational context. But my uh, big measure would be in the main policy documents of uh, the fund, which guides its uh, operations and the relationships to the various uh, countries. Uh, I think, uh, as you know, um, uh, the thinkers have always been ahead of the doers. Uh, and bridging that gap between thinkers and doers within that institution is not a small task, and they know it. Uh, and I think uh, it is also uh, the role not just of uh, fund staff in that context, uh, also the board of governors, which uh, 
include uh, precisely people who hold responsibilities in the member countries uh, to really take these messages and get that reflected in the policy uh, uh, manuals, operations, uh, that the fund would actually uh, be making uh, uh, going uh, forward. There are three conclusions that really grabbed me on the basis of the presentation. The first one is the fact that uh, inclusion is taken to be a means to development. Uh, and this is really shown by the result that lower net inequality drives faster and more durable sustained growth uh, uh, or stated uh, otherwise, higher inequality is bad for growth. So, uh, and this I think is a very fundamental shift from the conversation that uh, we had earlier. The second, and I think probably the more powerful one, is redistribution to realize inclusion as an end. It's generally benign in its impact on growth. Uh, I looked at that uh, uh, line, which was fairly much flat uh, and not showing any uh, negative major impact. But when you look at the other diagram, which had both direct and indirect impacts, when you combine the two, actually, uh, you get that the combined direct and indirect effects of redistribution are pro-growth, which is a very strong uh, conclusion. This says we don't have really just to wait for the trickle-down effects uh, in the process uh, of growth, uh, particularly where growth has tended to be uh, uh, moving with inequality, but uh, governments, countries can take proactive actions uh, to actually engineer uh, 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 equality through redistribution. It was definitely a no-no uh, in the past, and this, I think, is a, a very, very uh, important um, uh, turn uh, of events. Now, below that, there are Three others, as a policy maker, that really again grabbed me. One is austerity can be costly. And we know uh, in the past, whenever you had a crisis, uh, the policies that typically all of us were required to pursue were pro-cyclical, not counter-cyclical. And uh, when you are in trouble, you are required to exercise austerity. Uh, I think part of the lesson must have come from QE experience that the world has gone through, uh, where uh, in times of really stringent crisis in some of the key countries, uh, quantitative easing actually has been taken to be an instrument to get away from, from that trouble. Uh, and particularly for reversible shocks, we know you can finance reversible shocks. Uh, it is only the permanent shocks that you need typically to adjust to. And uh, it is, I think, uh, a very important, if you want, um, uh, redirection uh, of a policy stance uh, from that kind of conclusion. I was also struck by uh, the conclusion that paying down debt rapidly can be more costly than living with it. This is a huge statement. Uh, and we know uh, that's part of the new normal, where you can live with a debt to GDP ratio of uh, over 100% in some cases. Uh, provided uh, you are still going through a process of growth and 
uh, let growth actually get your ratio down rather than uh, engineer uh, a, 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 if you want a pay down of debt in order to get ratios uh, to the right uh, uh, um, uh, context. And lastly, uh, it's the very strong, uh, again, conclusion that uh, expansionary monetary policy uh, can reduce uh, inequality in the medium term, and that uh, tight monetary policy can actually increase uh, inequality. Uh, uh, for some of us who have been practicing on that sphere, uh, it would be really, really uh, strange if I had someone from the mission make this statement uh, in those times. Uh, but again, as I said, uh, this is the reality, and it is true that you have got just to consider the context in which these particular uh, 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 policy stances uh, are actually taken. So let me conclude by just answering one question, what I find significant about this research. One, it is the fact that this, this research is being done in the fund because that was the last frontier uh, against precisely the traditional view, not against, holding uh, fought the traditional view. And I must applaud uh, the research team for being brave enough, seriously, uh, I worked in the World Bank myself uh, in the past, and I know how difficult this, these things can be uh, when you try to make statements that uh, typically uh, are breaking new ground uh, in an institution which is regimented by tradition. So um, this is uh, one uh, uh, significance. Second significance, it's the fact that it goes beyond a good number of the academic research that was being done previously. Um, we know Barrow in 2000 uh, still upheld uh, the Kuznets U curve, uh, inverted U curve, but observed the exception in cases where incomes are less than $2,000, per capita incomes are less than $2,000. That was the first sort of movement away from uh, really sort of the uh, traditional view. In between, Nancy Bertzel and her team, uh, Ravi Kanbul, Alwalia, all used selective evidence uh, to support these same conclusions, mainly using the Asian experience to show that you can have rapid growth uh, also with uh, decreasing uh, inequality. Uh, and now we have here research which generalizes that particular result, not just drawing on selective examples, but uh, using data sets that cover uh, the whole world to be able to make uh, the same conclusions. And I think for that, I would end my comment in applauding the team for being brave enough. Uh, and the challenge is to move the idea from ideas and good advice to practice. That still, I think, is uh, uh, work in progress. Thank you. In the interest of time, let's zoom in straight to a few questions. We'll take just one round of questions. And then, and then we will break for coffee. Please, the, the gentleman at the back. The set of questions, and then I'll hand over to the panel. Okay. I'll be very quick. So, Douglas Arendt, I'm at the National Renewable Energy Lab. I've done a lot of work both with UNU Water, but also with the broader IPCC and UNFCCC on energy, climate, inequality, et cetera. So, I have two questions very quickly for the panel. One, did the theory that was presented at the beginning actually hold for China's growth? Because uh, it's not clear that it does. And then secondly, 
anywhere in your work or your colleagues' work are you taking into account or plan to take into account climate, both impacts as well as mitigation, because it's already known that that's disproportionately affecting uh, inequality. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for a brilliant panel. Um, I just wanted to follow on, on Ben and Dulu's excellent points um, about how to take forward this brilliant research and perhaps just ask about three specific points. Um, I think the evidence is very clear as presented by Jonathan Ostry and many others that uh, income distribution, redistribution favors growth. However, there's still, and there was in one of the presentations, an emphasis on flexible labor markets. Now, it, flexible labor markets have, of course, positive aspects, but they also tend to weaken labor. And if, when labor is weakened through, say, weak collective bargaining, uh, wages, real wages tend to go down or go down as proportion of total income. And that is a very strong element for deteriorating income distribution. So can we um, make sure that all the policy prescriptions are in line with the broad aim? Because if not, with one hand we're saying, uh, let's improve income distribution, but with the other hand, the fund or others are recommending policies that may actually deteriorate income distribution. Uh, secondly, it was shown again um, in the presentation of Jonathan that repaying debt too quickly, which means like having massive fiscal surpluses to do it, has, can lower growth. And I think the evidence is very strong. Um, but for example, in the Greek program, um, they are still committed to have very high fiscal surpluses for a very long time, um, over two and a half, three percent, which is you know very difficult to make consistent with growth. And I think uh, this is a very small example. Barbados has just signed an IMF agreement, which I think overall is very good. But they talk about. 6% primary fiscal surplus. And I think if anything can kill an economy is a 6% primary fiscal surplus. Um, and finally, Ben Odendulu made a nice point that reversible shocks uh, can be financed. Um, and I would like to ask whether there isn't a case for uh, these excellent compensatory financing facilities that the IMF has to be increased, particularly in the light of possible shocks uh, which are beginning to emerge in, in the world economy, like uh, tensions in the emerging markets, likely increases in interest rates in the US, and, and so on, um, and whether it wouldn't be a good time to, to revive these very good facilities, which work well, but which are relatively small scale. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh... Any other questions? Please, Finn. Thank you very much for an excellent panel. I mean, I, I really do appreciate it, and, and I certainly uh, would like to sort of subscribe to what Benny said. If uh, Jerry Helliner had been able to be here today, he would, he would have said, it's nice to see the IMF going wilder. Uh, in, 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 in the early years, Actually, he and a number of his colleagues were basically characterized going wilder with wider. <clears throat> but um, so this is just to stress that I do also highly appreciate uh, this line of research, and I, I really seriously do that. I have one slight worry. Um, I saw that, I mean, in, in, in two of the presentations, there was a strong reference to, to the use of an inequality database, which is somewhat controversial. And this is the salt weird. Uh, and there is actually advice out there not to use that database by leading people like Stephen Jenkins and others who have, have looked quite carefully at it. So I'm, I'm just sort of wondering whether, uh, I mean, have you been digging more into this? Have you tested the, I mean, how conclusions might change if, if you actually uh, don't use his approach to filling the gaps? It's just to sort of, uh, 
Because I'm a little bit afraid that, I mean, might there be a backlash if it shows up that when uh, a more appropriate database uh, becomes available and then some of the conclusions might not stand up? I mean, I'm asking the question more as sort of a data uh, concerned person rather than uh, in any way suggesting that I don't appreciate the policy conclusions, because I do, I mean, and I think anybody looking at Wilder's work would, 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 would agree with that. But I'm sort of slightly worried about that data point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Finn. Uh, the microphone here, please. Um, Kunal Senyu and Wilder, thank you for lots of very, the very interesting presentations. So far, the comments have been very positive from the flow. We're going to take a slightly different track. Um, and so in the first presentation, Jonathan, what I wasn't really clear about the causal mechanisms behind the inequality growth relationship. Is it true credit constraints being, uh, being elevated, collateral being more for the poor, that leads to higher growth? Is it true essentially human capital distribution is changing, so the inequality opportunity changes, that leads to higher growth? Is it true essentially market power being reduced or bigger firms, that leads to higher growth because market power is just a to growth? So all these causal mechanisms are not clear, and therefore one kind of worry is that what you're really capturing are some simply correlations and not causality, because in a panel regression, the inequality growth issue goes both ways, as we know. And it's very difficult to have an instrument that actually meets exclusion restriction in a time-varying sense. So without getting into the causal mechanisms, it's pretty difficult to understand whether we have a causal relationship here or pure correlation. So I just worry about the fact that there isn't much, hasn't been, as far as you could see, more thought on the causal mechanisms. Similar question of second, present, uh, second presentation, export diversification being good for growth. Well, take, take, think about Bangladesh. When Bangladesh started the growth process, pretty much went to ready-made garments. It still has about over 70% of ready-made garments. Nobody will ever say to Bangladesh that, you know, maybe in the future they should, but right now they're doing very well to have the highest growth rates in South Asia and certainly in, in, in Asia itself, um, outside of East Asia. So if you look at Bangladesh experience and diversification or oh, concentration, it's been good for them. But then you look at, say, an oil-rich country. So where you concentrate in oil, yes, you can see the problems with, with oil concentration being essentially bad for growth or volatility of growth. So then the question really is that what exactly are we diversifying away from? And what are we concentrating into? Also, are we, con are we diversifying, diversifying in a way that's market-friendly or market compared to advantage conforming or not? So I think the story of diversification and growth has to be thought through a little bit more carefully because I'm not really sure you can actually go and say to countries in many parts of Asia, for example, who are concentrating on particular kinds of commodities which have been good, good for them, that they should think of getting away with those commodities and going in for diversification. So it's a little bit more complex than what I think we heard so far. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, I think I'll invite the panelists and we can continue the discussions in the corridors or during the coffee break. So thank you very much for the uh, questions. Um, my colleagues will respond to some of them. We, we're not going to respond to questions uh, that um, where the basis for the question was not in anything that we said. So we're not going to talk about compensatory financing facilities uh, and, and so forth. I'm going to respond to a couple things. Um, uh, your point about uh, the SWID database. I think you were slightly um, misleading in uh, mentioning Jenkins' criticism of the SWID data database um, without mentioning Fred Soltz's rebuttal to Jenkins. So we have to be balanced here. People have lots of skin in these different games. Um, and we have to be scientific. We have to put our data out. We have to put our results out. And we have to be open, uh, as you said, to um, uh, people uh, running, running new regressions using uh, alternative data and uh, overturning uh, results. We have to be humble. We have to be scientific. Um, we have to be as objective as we can. The only thing I would say also is that um, uh, if you can suggest um, an alternative database that has the coverage in terms of the cross-section and the time series that Fred has, um, we would be open uh, to using that. But as far as I know, uh, SALT is the only game in town for a study of, um, of the one that we were interested in running, covering a, a variety of countries at different stages of development. Um, and I think Fred, uh, the, the SWID database, he is very uh, upfront about the many, many shortcomings of his database. He has nothing to hide. Um, we decided uh, to make use of this 
I think, uh, to ask this question, but we're certainly open and humble and, and, and so forth. Um, channels. Um, uh, uh, the uh, tremendous difficulty of uh, causal interpretations of macro data. Again, let's not be holier than thou here. Um, I think uh, there is a long discussion on causal mechanism in the JEG paper. Um, there are uh, uh, probably 10 possible or more causal interpretations. Uh, there are fertility channels. There's Roderick's story about resilience. There's access to education, to health, to the political process, to nutrition, all of these things. Uh, this is, uh, we, I think we are upfront and humble about what we can say on the basis of macro data. Um, you can say, well, if you can't say anything that's uh, truly causally convincing, then let's just uh, go home. Uh, we don't, that's not our philosophy. We, we, we did the best we can with macro data. We're uh, open uh, for others to try and, uh, and do better. Um, I think uh, uh, Chris will talk about climate um, and uh, uh, Deputy may talk about the labor market. Um, I, I do want to say on China, um, you know, yes and no. Um, uh, people say, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll choose different bits of China's history uh, and say well, it was growing well and highly unequal. It was taking off from a position of tremendous equality and doing well. You know, so I, I, I think our point is to try and uh, draw inference from uh, the wealth of all of the data um, and we have a discussion of China in the paper. We have a discussion of Brazil. You can pick different countries and, and, and use our results uh, however you please. Minutes each and then okay. so that people can... Uh, very quickly to respond to a couple of issues that came up, one on climate change and the other on diversification. On climate change, we share with you the concern, especially when it relates uh, to macro issues, you know, you know, issues of climate change that affect the macro uh, 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 picture of the economy. This cannot be more true than when you look at small states where shocks uh, are, uh, have an immense impact. And this is where we started to do some more serious work. If you think about the, a climate shock, it's more or less like an economic shock. It differs a little bit in the nature, but it hits the country like an economic shock. So uh, we have a couple of, <clears throat> excuse me, couple of uh, good uh, work to show for uh, what we have done so far. The first is a WIO uh, chapter in 2017, April 2017, I believe. Uh, it was more focused on developing economies as opposed to emerging and advanced economies. Uh, and then we have a very nice paper just, just uh, is forthcoming in J in Journal of Development Economics on focusing uh, on the impact uh, of uh, natural disaster shocks in growth and inequality in small states. On diversification, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, we are not advocating that diversification is uh, good for growth for all countries. Actually, the opposite. And that's why we created this new index of quality, just to make this point. For commodity exporters and small states, we recognize also that these guys have the comparative advantage on you know, focusing on only a couple of products. The question is how do they go beyond that? And the answer could be on improving on the quality dimension. Thank you. Just very quick on the labor markets. Uh, I think like we, indeed we have recent research showing that uh, uh, you know, policies to make the labor market more flexible uh, along the line that you mentioned. Uh, indeed, uh, has shown evidence to reduce the bargaining power of workers and to reduce the labor share of income. So we find that for several advanced economies, actually these policies have had uh, a really uh, sizable effect. Uh, however, uh, I think like this is discussion falls a bit in what uh, Jonathan was saying, is that uh, many of these reform, uh, uh, like for example, labor market, uh, are typically intended to boost efficiency, uh, to boost the supply. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think uh, more work uh, has to be done to realize that uh, many of these policies actually have distributional consequences. So I think like for, you know, we are doing a significant progress in showing evidence that this is the case. And again, I guess the next step would be to uh, 
uh, to tailor these policies and in the designs in a way that uh, uh, can have less uh, harmful trade-off. I just want to, uh, to say that, uh, as Jonathan said, we are not going to enter into country-specific issues, but there is an ongoing um, review of our concessional facility that should be completed this year, just for your information. Thank you.